Okay, good evening everyone uh, in the Long Room Hub at Trinity College Dublin here and also at home or wherever you may watch us as we are live streaming uh, tonight's uh, event. It uh, gives also you the opportunity to watch it later on if you go to the Trinity Long Room Hub Facebook page for example. My name is Daniel Fass, I'm the convener of the Identities and Transformation Research Team and Associate Professor here at Trinity. I'm also co-organizer of the lecture series, Trinity and the Changing City, uh, together with my colleagues Sarah Kerr and uh, Tom Walker, who are in the audience uh, here tonight. Uh, tonight's panel is the second in that series. On October 11th, we had a very successful inaugural public event on Dublin housing, then and now. Uh, and on December 6th, uh, we will be talking about seeing other Dublins, which will feature contributions from the poet, playwright and former Ireland Chair of Poetry, Paul Amien. Uh, and the artist Dorothy Smith and the academic Zeli Asava. But back to tonight's um, proceedings, we have three fascinating engaging speakers for you to talk about Dublin's migrants. Dublin, as you are aware, uh, has experienced very rapid social change in recent years, becoming increasingly culturally, ethnically and religiously diverse uh, due to large-scale inward migration. Uh, and considering ongoing debates how to balance social cohesion on the one hand and migration-related diversity on the other hand, uh, our three speakers will engage um, with, the, with these and related issues and shed light uh, on those topics. And uh, I'll introduce them each in turn. They will then speak for about 15 minutes. And then after the three have spoken, uh, we'll open the floor to a Q&A session um, as well. But let me also flag up that at the end of that, after the Q&A session, we have a short 18-minute documentary film, One in a Million, that I'm going to introduce at that stage about a Pakistani refugee in Berlin um, and his uh, trajectory and journey. And this will lead us up to a very fascinating book launch performing statelessness in Europe right above where we currently are in the Hoey's idea space uh, where um, uh, Steve Wilmer's book, uh, published by Pilgrim Macmillan, uh, Performing Statelessness in Europe, will be launched. So we'll be grateful if all of you stayed around uh, for that book launch as well. I promise there is one or more glasses of wine that you can enjoy as well, so that would be enough incentive on top of the book uh, to go upstairs um, right after uh, this event here. And they're also linked, given the topic, of course, which is why we've scheduled them um, one after the other. So back to uh, Dublin's migrants, to the, to the panel. And uh, first up is uh, Professor Brian Fanning uh, from UCD. Brian is Professor of Migration and Social Policy at UCD. And he looks particularly at migration and social policy against, and I quote him there, uh, what he calls the background noise amplified on the internet of xenophobic anxiety and political nativism promoted by some politicians who claim that walls and not bridges will bring us security, stability, and prosperity, end of quote. Brian's research interests also include the modernization of Irish society, with a focus on the history of ideas and debates that have shaped its development. He's written many books on both of these topics, uh, and examples include Histories of the Irish Future, which is an intellectual history of the predicaments facing Ireland as understood by key writers since 1650, and then... Um, very relevant for tonight, of course, uh, the 2018 book, it came out in February uh, by UCD Press, Migration and the Making of Ireland, which is a history of immigration since 1600, which also addresses migration uh, from Ireland. And the talk title um, will be Migration and the Making of Dublin. Uh, I'm delighted you're here with us tonight, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Daniel, and uh, thank you for having me here. Migration and the Making of Ireland is the book, and what I'm taking tonight is something abstracted from that, that, some of the bits about Dublin. I mean, the book itself, you know, is a, runs across four centuries. Uh, and the thing about writing something across four centuries if you're a social scientist is how do you methodologically compare things, you know, across all that time. So, you know, you're working from memoirs, you're working from, from, from the documents of religious organizations, you're working from modern sociological studies, in which people are anonymized. But it, it occurred to me as I did the book that the same commonalities keep coming up, whether people are migrating to or from Ireland. And those are family. People migrate to uh, places for or with the help of their families. Uh, economics always tends to come into it somehow. People migrate to make better livings for themselves. Um, law. Law comes into it, especially in recent centuries because the restrictions and difficulties faced by some more so than others have a huge impact on structuring the chances 
and opportunities that people face. So when people think about Irish migration around the world, it is worth remembering that most Irish people went most of the time to countries where there were no legal barriers, no linguistic barriers, where they were treated, even if there was discrimination, as if they were citizens from the get-go. And that is something better than, more than, many migrants in the 21st century world, including those some people coming to Ireland experience. Uh, what I want to do tonight is just talk about Dublin a bit, uh, because Dublin crops up in the book in various chapters. And there is an introduction <coughs> chapter, and of course you start at the very, very beginning as far as you can find one. But with Dublin, that's about the Vikings. And what's interesting about the Vikings is um, that, um, that they're, they're associated with the founding of Dublin, uh, and by the time we get to, to, to the 11th century, you know, there's a slave market in Dublin where Irish kings sell their slaves abroad, and captives are shipped in. And it's only when the Normans come to Dublin that the slave markets of Dublin close down. And that strikes me as an interesting aspect of migration and forced labour of a certain kind. Uh, raids inland for slaves and bounty overlapped with commerce between Dublin, Waterford and Limerick. And each of those had their hinterlands. And there were wars between those cities. And at the times when they were dominated by Vikings. Uh, in 927, <coughs> Viking Waterford defeated Viking Limerick in battle. And ten years later, Viking Dublin <coughs> captured the ruler of Limerick and broke up his fleet. And then, 953 AD, Vikings you know, uh, uh, from Dublin attack Waterford Harbour. And then in the, in the 990s, Vikings from Waterford briefly ruled Dublin. So, you know, excavations from Viking settlements reveal drainage systems, house structures, boat building, and much evidence of trading. Irish goods found by archaeologists in Norway seem to be more often than not the products of trade rather than plunder. It, the Normans were the next perhaps big phase and the Anglo-Normans coming to Ireland, but even long before they physically arrived here, their influence was present in Dublin. For example, the church in Dublin was seen very much as part of the, you know, under the control of the Archbishop of Canterbury and had nothing to do with ecclesiastical politics in the rest of Ireland. So, you know, bishops in Dublin were being chosen, you know, across the, across the Irish Sea at that particular time. And then King Henry II had the bright idea of, 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 of granting you know, of, of kind of the Archbishop of Canterbury, pardon me, granted Ireland to Henry II. Uh, so when Henry gets control of Dublin and Waterford and Wexford, he keeps the towns and hinterlands as royal possessions. And royal charters, he and his descendants, uh, you know, give, encourage migrants to come to Ireland by, by, making, by making it attractive to traders and craftsmen uh, from abroad. So Henry II granted Dublin to the, city of, uh, to, to the men of the city of Bristol to colonise and run. Uh, so control of trade was similarly exercised in both cities through a merchant guild system established by royal charters. The first membership of the role of, of, of the Dublin Merchant Guild from 1190 or so, uh, you get a list of people who conducted business, including some 3,000 names. A handful of these had Irish names. Many of the names were names of, of people from other countries and places. Some had Viking names, some were from what would now be called the Netherlands, some were from northern and western France, most apparently were from South Wales, the West Midlands of England, and especially from Bristol. So there's a roll of around 500 men admitted as free men to Dublin between, 20, sorry, between 1230 and 1249. And this includes bakers, cooks, spicers, taverners, millers, brewers, and fishermen, tailors, dyers, fullers, weavers, furriers, goldsmiths, armourers, carpenters, and masons. So all of these professions are sort of transnational to an extent. Uh, so we have this, this sense of Dublin as, as a fairly cosmopolitan place, uh, it, 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 its, trade is, its, its trade is basically, uh, you know, international. People are coming to for, and from the place. That the economic relationships are, in a sense, colonial ones. But then, you know, with a, 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 subsequently, Dublin manages to buy its independence from that charter to Bristol from a king for essentially giving another royal loan across. So we, we get Dublin's role in Ireland contracting over time with the Black Death, especially, you know, the old sort of Anglo-Norman sort of portion of the island kind of contracts into what might be called the Pale of Dublin. There were other factors too, uh, but what we begin to see there is, is a sort of a, a very distinct character of Dublin from the rest of the island. We begin to see more migration to Ireland subsequently from groups such as Huguenots and, 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 and Jews in relatively small numbers. You see Jews coming from around the 13th century onwards. Something about the Jews is that the Jews were expelled from England in the 13th century. There were around, I think, uh, there might have been around 15,000 at the time, I think. And what's interesting about that is they were expelled formally. And, you know, up until then people could come and go and no passports were required. But Jews that lived in England, and they did in the centuries that followed, 
they were essentially people who had to pretend to be otherwise. They had to be, pretend to be Spanish migrants. They, they were described as Spanish, as Moreno Spanish migrants in, 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 in uh, England. And to some extent in Ireland as well, smaller numbers show up. And it was only the Cromwellian regime that essentially the presence of Jews was legalized again. And that saw the beginning of another wave of migration to Ireland of people who were Jewish, who often came from Europe and from England. The numbers were relatively small. The numbers were relatively small. The, the, the Huguenots are a very interesting population. Huguenots are essentially French Calvinists. They, they lost out in, in conflicts in, in, in France. They gave their names to the, the word refugee actually comes from a term used to describe Huguenots in French. And initially, many of them migrated to the court of William of Orange in the Netherlands. They became part then of William of Orange's ar uh, army in the Battle of the Boyne. And, and then subsequently, people were settled in Ireland in various towns such as Port Arlington, but also in the cities. There were also before that, during the English Civil War, in, in the aftermath of that, pardon me, in the Restoration, uh, some, some, some Huguenots were settled in Ireland and came to live in places such as Chapel Izzard in Dublin. Uh, and what was very interesting about them was that they came as uh, French-speaking Calvinists, but they were very much encouraged to join the established church. And the deal was, was struck with them was that they could keep their French language. And they chose to keep their French language and indeed worshipped in French in, in various places in Dublin and around the country for generations, including in the cathedral in St. Patrick's, where they had basically a portion of, 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 of that church. So we see small populations of Huguenots, small populations of Jews. Uh, we, we basically see further waves of Jews coming to Ireland in very small numbers, perhaps 20, 30 families at a time. There is a cemetery in, 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 in Ballybro in an area now known as Fairview that dates from 1718. And the oldest Jewish gravestone still standing dates from 1777. So what we see in Ireland is basically, you know, Always there's going to be small numbers uh, of people who are Jewish. There are probably many people from other countries as well whose names are not recorded, uh, whose names where historians have not necessarily done the work or where the archives don't exist. And we begin to see in the 19th century a, a much larger expansion of Jewish migration to Dublin. Uh, this basically begins to happen from the 1820s when we see Jews arriving from England, Holland, France, Germany, Poland, Galicia, Russia, Lithuania, Morocco in relatively small numbers. Uh, and the first Jew, I think, to graduate from, Jewish person to graduate from Trinity, was David, Ro David Rosenthal, who became a lawyer in Dublin. He would have been born in 1833, died in 1907. Uh, he became a, a lawyer in Dublin, and he became the Dublin community's representative on the Jewish Board of Deputies in London. So the connection was transnational again. The Jewish community was small enough and looked essentially to, to London for its organisation. Uh, so therefore it was a transnational community too. And an awful lot of the biographies of that particular era have families that come and go, have family members in different countries coming to Ireland, moving back to Britain, maybe moving into the United States and then returning to Ireland. Uh, these stories are, are complex stories of migration, a bit like ones which we see in the world today. Uh, we begin to see from the 1880s a considerable expansion of the Jewish community in Dublin. And these, tend, these are coming from Lithuania. And most of them are coming from 10 villages in what's now Lithuania. Lithuania at that time would have been part of the Russian Empire. And it's often understood that pogroms had a lot to do with it. But it was probably more complicated than that. Uh, the, the economy was certainly ch changing locally. And it was perhaps easier for, for people from Lithuania who were Jewish to begin to continue the trades they were doing in places like Ireland that weren't, where the competition from German traders and factories wasn't quite as intensive. There was also the fear of uh, conscription to the Russian army. And uh, there is a sort of a sense also of trade relationships between the, the Baltic coast and Cork Harbour in particular. So ships would have come forward and back, and wherever there's a route, a trade route or an airplane route, people will travel. Wherever there's a road, people will go up it and go down it. So there are an awful lot of memoirs and documents of, uh, of Jews in, 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 in 19, well, 20th century Ireland mostly, but look back, looking back towards the late 19th century. Uh, and these describe a community that, uh, you know, a, a look back community in particular, that is quite different from, in the sense that they're Lithuanians, they're coming from different countries of origin than Jews who had been in Ireland before in smaller numbers. And they don't form one homogenous community, but there are different synagogues and cliques and people not necessarily cooperating with another, one another. And there are also, of course, faith differences between them, between Orthodox 
and more reformed or less orthodox Jewish uh, community as worshippers. So the idea that the Jewish community constitutes a homogenous entity doesn't make an awful lot of sense. But what we begin to see in the 1990s, or by that time, are, are, are pronounced settlements around the South Circular Road, uh, in an area that came to be known as Little Jerusalem, where there were shops, as well as a, a synagogue uh, on the Adelaide Road, uh, where basically many of the Lithu Lithuanian community came to centre themselves. Uh, and this is an area now no longer has that Jewish presence. The people who've lived in that, their, their children, their grandchildren, their great child, grandchildren moved to places like Turnure and Macfarnham, where the synagogues are now. Uh, did Jews experience discrimination in Ireland? Well, certainly there is an awful lot of documented material to suggest that they did. Uh, I could give you many facts, but one that strikes me at this minute in time is in 1933, uh, Jewish adults in Dublin set up the McCabe Golfing Society because they could not get into golf clubs in Dublin. So, you know, and in, in, in 1944 they established their own golf club at Edmundstown, and they opened that to non-Jewish members as well. So there was discrimination against Jews in Ireland, as in other countries. There was anti-Semitism, as in other countries. Um, and, and uh, you know, Jewish, Jewish history is perhaps particularly well known or reflected upon because of James Joyce's great novel. Ireland is a country that people are tending to leave more so than arrive at for many centuries. The 17th century was a period of great comings and goings. Uh, large numbers of people come into Ireland from Scotland, from, from, from England and so on. Uh, significant numbers of people move out from Ireland to the colonies, to, to England, but to the the Americas in particular. Uh, the 19th century, with the exception of Jews, does not see, see a large amount of migration to Ireland. It's mostly people going out and in very large numbers. Uh, what we begin to see in recent decades are, are the arrival of refugees and asylum seekers. From the 1950s we get Hungarians, in, in the late 1970s, well, around 1979, we get, we get Vietnamese, <coughs> refugees coming to Dublin. And their story strikes me as a particularly Dublin one, in the sense that when they arrived, the Dominant ideas at the time were to essentially split up that community quite deliberately and settle families one at a time in towns around Ireland to isolate them from one another with the idea or ideology that assimilation would take place more easily in that way. But what happened fairly quickly was that people left where they were placed and moved back together and, and established basically uh, communities in Dublin in places like Coolock and Talla and Clondalkin. Uh, so, these are people who not just migrated to Ireland, but migrated within Ireland as well. And essentially came back together to a considerable extent. Uh, until the 1990s, the main sort of story about migration to Ireland that you know, people would remark upon, other than say Jewish migrants coming to Ireland, would have been the experiences of, of refugees in particular. Groups of refugees, including the Bosnians in the 90s, as well as... Uh, as, 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 as well as the Vietnamese, as well as the Hungarians at an earlier stage. Um, these, groups, these groups basically are relatively small populations, and they were joined in the, in, in the Celtic Tiger period by, as we all know, much larger numbers of people, and also towards the end of the 20th century by much larger numbers of refugees and asylum seekers. But there were also other groups that came into Dublin, in particular uh, in the 1960s, for example, there were a couple of hundred of African university students in Dublin, many of whom had come to study in medical schools in, in, in the Dublin area. And you know, there's quite a lot of uh, newspaper reporting around the early 1960s of, of racist attacks against Africans in Dublin at that time. And it became a diplomatic incident between the Irish and Nigerian governments because essentially the son of a highly ranked judge in Nigeria who had been studying medicine in Ireland got very, very badly beaten up. Uh, and it was students at this particular university that were engaged in activism about that racism at that very early stage. And one of the student leaders was actually, I think, Vincent Brown, you know? So, so there, there are these little hidden histories and this idea that there was nobody from other places in the 1960s in Dublin. You know, that's not the case at all. There were people from, from many different countries. And, and a lot of that reason for that was that Ireland had many links to other places. I mean, in, for example... Um, you know, Nigeria, for example, Irish teachers, you know, were teaching hundreds of thousands of pupils. Most of them were religious. Uh, the Igbo people in particular were Catholic. Uh, the Irish missionaries ran large numbers of hospitals again. So these connections bring two-way journeys. The Irish also, in their United Nations sort of role, were engaged with, 
with people in South Africa who were fleeing apartheid and middle class ones, you know, who could afford to do so, send some of their sons and mostly sons to Ireland to study here. So we have these sorts of connections to the universities, uh, and in particular with Dublin. In more, in, in more recent times, we begin to see Dublin taking on a very diverse population. And we begin to see patterns of settlement in Dublin that are, that are you know, perhaps could be done better with maps and charts. But what I would turn around and say is that in the late 1990s, for example, Parnell Street was known in particular as a place where quite a lot of uh, refugees and asylum seekers were, were housed or temporarily. And this was before the introduction of direct provision, which also came up with a policy of sending people around the country, of decentralising people quite deliberately. So until that time, most people came to Dublin. So around Parallel Street, there are you know, people engaged in businesses of African background, you know, on, on, on Moore Street and so on, for, for decades now at this stage. And we, so if you look at the statistics of migrant occupancy in inner city Dublin, you would see that it's quite pronounced. But why are migrants living in these wards in particular? It's because at that particular time, that's where the housing was available. That's where the, the rented accommodation was available. And what you begin to see then, maybe in, in, in the time of uh, the early 21st century, is that people are moving to areas like Blanchardstown. It, it, for reasons, again, about the availability of new housing coming on stream, housing that was available to rent. So, so you, you also get basically people moving for, uh, you know, from places like Mosny nearby. And all of the stories of migration are essentially stories of, of chain migration. Simply put, most people have limited enough experience of the world. They grow up on one street in one village in one town. They meet somebody uh, from their locality. Perhaps they move to another part of the world. And they may move, move to another street, another village, another town. And there often are then connections forged by the fact that people follow their relatives and their friends and security offered by family members and, and people from the same community. So that there are often deep connections between communities in Dublin and other places, uh, almost on a street by street basis. Um, I don't know what else to say about this because I do, certainly don't want to be eating into the time for uh, available to my, 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 my co-speakers here to follow on. But the, 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 point about, the point about migration in Ireland is that there are so many stories that are yet to be told. And in efforts to try and understand the stories of the last 20 years, you know, social scientists can look at studies here and there, we can look at the census and so on and so forth. But in the time to come, these will be joined by biographies, by novels, by all manner of things produced by migrant communities themselves. And it really ultimately is the job, I suppose, and the role of those communities to tell their own stories. And, you know, our sense of Irish history and what has gone into the making of it will become richer for all of that. It is striking that the Ireland's Jewish community, a relatively small community of a few thousand at peak, you know, it's, it has produced so many memoirs, so many stories, so many archives. Uh, you know, it, it has documented its history. Uh, and, and, and indeed, therefore, you know, quite a number of books have been written about this, and memoirs from people in those communities. And I'd like to think in the near times to come that we'll see basically an explosion of literatures, both uh, social science literatures, uh, biographies, as well as basically novels and creative works, in which people will add to the pages of the story of this city. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian, for this wonderful and um, detailed uh, historical overview. Uh, next up is Dr. Emma Quinn from the Economic and Social Research Institute. Emma is the head of the European Migration Network, the Irish national contact point of the European Migration Network within the ESRI. And the European Migration Network, Ireland, publishes objective and reliable research and information on migration and asylum. Studies have addressed a wide range of topics, including irregular migration, protection, unaccompanied minors and return migration, labor migration. And uh, the EMN uh, also coordinates a network of organizations active in the migration and asylum fields in Ireland and holds regular conferences and seminars on, on these topics. And Emma is the joint coordinator of the research area Migration, Integration and Demography at the ESRI. And together with her colleagues, um, she co-authors integration-related research, including the Monitoring Report and Integration Series. And that monitoring report contains a range of national-level indicators on migrant uh, integration. And the 2018 <coughs> report, which we will hear about now, was actually launched yesterday. So it couldn't be more uh, current. So without further ado... I welcome Emma, and here are the slides. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. Thank you to Daniel and his colleagues for this invitation to present here today. Also for the plug for the European Migration Network, which is my main area of work and which I would uh, like to, to make you aware of as a resource, as a useful uh, place to go to look for information on migration. Uh, but I'll, get, I'll come back to that. Uh, to this evening, I want to present the, the results of the, the just published uh, monitoring report on integration um, 2018. We, we published it yesterday, as, as Daniel noted. Um, when I received the invitation to this event, I thought it was such an interesting event, but I had to confess that we hadn't done anything specifically on Dublin or indeed at the regional level in relation to integration. So what I can present this evening is very much um, a national uh, bird's eye view of integration. But of course it's highly relevant to, to tonight's topic and I hope that you can take some, some useful information from that. Um, the aim of the, the monitoring of border integration is really to provide um, good evidence for an informed debate. Um, we see across Europe how sensitive the, the debate on migration can be and we believe that the monitor is, is really important for providing the facts and figures to, to, to base that debate um, uh, on, on hard information. Uh, it is so I mentioned it's a bird's eye view, it's, it's a national report, it compiles national level indicators, so it can't look at the lived experience, that's, that's one of its limitations. Um, it doesn't uh, include modelling, we, we present, um, we present a descriptive uh, analysis. Um, in terms of the structure, we, we look at national level indicators in the domains of employment, education, social inclusion and active citizenship and each year we look at a special thing. Um, we use the best available national data and we um, strive for comparability between the, uh, between the monitors. This is the sixth in a series of such monitors. The first four were um, funded by the NGO, the Integration Centre, which has since become part of the MCO Council of Ireland. And the latter two, this one and the previous one, was funded by the Department of Justice, the Office for the Promotion of Migrant Integration. Um, I need to, to uh, note my authors. You can see there's a huge team of authors involved in this report, led by uh, Professor Francis McGinnity. Um, so I'll do my best to do, to do justice to the, uh, the, their hard work. So looking then first at the, the findings on the labour market integration of, of migrants. Um, this area has received some attention in the media in, in recent days and indeed it is interesting uh, what we find here. Um, the analysis is limited to the 15 to 64 working age population. And here we find that uh, rising unemployment and falling, uh, rising employment and falling unemployment for both Irish and non-Irish groups, and this is unsurprising perhaps given the, the labour market recovery. The data relate to <coughs> quarter one of 2016 and 2017. What was interesting was that the employment rates uh, for working age uh, non-Irish nationals were actually higher than for Irish nationals, so 70% compared to 66% in 2017. We were able to break this out, the non-Irish group, out a little further. Um, I'll show you a graph in a few minutes. Um, and in that analysis, that further analysis, African nationals emerged with a particularly low employment rate of 45%. Um, in 2017 data, the unemployment uh, gap between Irish and non-Irish nationals had narrowed. Um, and these are the employment rates. Um, you can see there the, um, the EU West, that's the so-called old EU member states, um, are faring particularly well in terms of the employment rate, and uh, the African group has an employment rate of 45%. Um, in terms of unemployment, um, the African, African group again emerged as um, a group facing challenges uh, with an unemployment rate of a 16%, and interestingly, that had actually gone up since 2016, um, which was a surprise given the, the improving economic conditions. Um, that was 14% uh, in 2016. Turning then to education, um, a, a really vital area of migrant integration to, to look at um, 
uh, you know, the, the access to, to education and good education, of course, influences uh, outcomes across a whole range of, of integration uh, outcomes. Um, we can see that the non-Irish group is um, advantaged in terms of access to our, uh, in terms of attainment to third level. So 50% of the overall non-Irish group holds a third level qualification compared to 37% of the Irish group. Uh, we limit the analysis to uh, the 25 to 34 age group here because of the educational gradient within the Irish population. So we know that older Irish people are less likely to hold a third level qualification. Uh, we can see that the gap between the Irish and the non-Irish narrows when we look at this narrower um, age cohort, but the, the non-Irish still retains the, the advantage in terms of access to third level. Again, the EU West group emerges as particularly advantaged here, um, and EU East uh, shows um, a percentage of 40% um, third level education. This may be related to um, a prevalence of more vocational type courses in, um, at, at below third level in countries such as Poland. Um, Yes, and also the non-EU group has a, has a high proportion of um, third level attainment. Because uh, large scale migration to Ireland is relatively new, the majority of adults will have uh, received their, their education outside of Ireland. And it's important then to look at <coughs> students who um, have had experience of the Irish education system just to, to, to monitor how uh, the system is, is uh, facilitating integration of non-Irish here. Um, for this, we use the OECD PISA survey, which looks at students at age uh, 15. Um, it, uh, it distinguishes between the students and the parents' place of birth, and also the languages spoken at home, which means that we are able to identify immigrant um, students with an immigrant background, and these are immigrant immigrant children who are either born abroad and or both their parents are born abroad. The sample is about uh, 5,700 and 14% of the sample is classified as immigrant. Um, so the, the main finding in this analysis is that the main reading scores were lower among migrants from non-English speaking backgrounds. But there's no <coughs> statistically significant difference between migrants from English language backgrounds and their Irish peers. <coughs> uh, no difference also was found between uh, the migrant group and Irish peers in mathematics and science. So that really underlines the importance of uh, language um, in educational outcomes. The analysis on social inclusion um, aims to assess the risk of migrants becoming excluded based on their um, the limited economic resources. Um, and uh, poverty is analysed in several ways by my colleague uh, Bertrand Maitre. So uh, we look at the at risk of po poverty, which is the um, the rate here reflects um, the proportion with an income below 60% of the mean equivalised uh, income. And here, the rates for the non-Irish group are considerably higher from the for from the Irish group at 22% compared to 16%. And this at risk of poverty rate is particularly high among the non-EU nationals. <coughs> Another way to look at poverty is by measuring deprivation, which is uh, defined as lacking two or more basic items <coughs> on the list. Um, for example, food, clothes, heating. Um, this this uh, finding was also higher among the, the non-Irish um, at 24% than Irish nationals at 21%. Um, consistent poverty combines these two measures. Um, again, we get a, a high proportion of non-EU nationals um, in consistent poverty, so that's 29%. Um, and the group that emerged with a particularly low experience of con consistent poverty is this advantaged, uh, relatively advantaged EU West group, which showed just 3% of consistent poverty. Um, there's just uh, one indicator reported on health, um, and we find that non-Irish nationals do report better health on average than Irish nationals, 89 versus 
but just bearing in mind that this is a younger group, uh, so that may account for, for some of that. Um, the analysis on home uh, ownership uh, is interesting, perhaps unsurprisingly we find a lot lower um, home ownership among the non-Irish group than among the Irish group, 26 as opposed to 76%. Um, this can reflect different attitudes to, to owning a home, it can reflect also um, you know, personal preferences, access to credit, um, uh, income, etc. Um, the the uh, related finding is, of course, um, in regard to the private rented uh, accommodation sector. And over half of non-Irish are, are currently um, housed in the private rented accommodation sector. And this compares to just 7% of Irish. So there's a really big, um, really big gap identified there. In terms of active citizenship, uh, we're limited uh, somewhat in what we can look at uh, by data availability. So our analysis <coughs> focuses on naturalisation, on long-term residence, and on political participation. Thank you. And the numbers here, uh, in terms of naturalisation, will probably come as no surprise to you, are, are really big in recent years. So 140,000 non-Irish nationals naturalised between 2005 and uh, 2017. Um, there have been interesting changes in the past um, few years. We had a big peak, which I'll show you shortly in a graph, in 20, uh, 2012 in um, the numbers naturalising. And that's fallen off steadily since um, to reach uh, just, um, just over 8,000 in 2017. Um, but also the composition um, in terms of the, the nationality of people adopting Irish citizenship has shifted. So in 2012, 94% of people naturalising um, were of non-EU origin, and this had dropped to 55% in 2012, or sorry, in 2017. So the top, natural, the top uh, nationalities naturalising <coughs> in 2017 were in fact Polish, Romanian and Indian, so that's, that's quite a change um, on earlier years. In terms of um, long-term residents, uh, Ireland is uh, one of the few EU member states that doesn't have a statutory um, long-term residence permission, and this is something that's been flagged in uh, several monitors over the years. It is an action in the migrant integration strategy to, to address this and provide uh, long-term residence status with um, transparent uh, rights and entitlements similar to that provided for under the, uh, the EU directive. Um, at the moment, uh, just 1.2% of migrants aged 16 and over are, are currently hold long-term residents in Ireland, which is, uh, which is very low. Um, just to note that the, this chapter is based on administrative rather than survey data and we don't have a population register so we're limited to the population aged 16 and over because of course under 16s don't register and there are no, there are no data on um, non-EU uh, children in Ireland. Um, we look at the political participation of migrants and we find that a Migrants are very underrepresented, both in terms of voters and elected uh, representatives. Um, just in relation to Dublin specifically, we find that 5.7% of people on the voting register are non-Irish, and this compares to 19.2% of the population uh, aged 18 and over uh, in the Dublin city uh, area. So a really big gap there. Um, similarly, uh, big gaps found in Kildare and uh, Galway County. Um, and nationally, then, the, the equivalent figures are 5.1 and 13%. So I'd better uh, pick up the pace somewhat. Um, this just illustrates the trends that I uh, described in relation to the issue of <coughs> naturalisation certificates. You can see the, um, the, the fall off in the non-EA group and the, the slower uh, drop off in the um, EEA nationals. So, special theme uh, this year was on Muslims in Ireland. Um, we use census data to have a look at the Muslim population. We are um, very much aware that it's not, uh, Muslims are not a migrant group per se, but 70% were born outside of Ireland. Um, we also felt that there was a lack of data on this group and, and uh, saw the, the census as a good opportunity to, to 
uh, provide some information um, specific to the Irish context. Um, so there's been a big growth in, in the Muslim population in Ireland uh, from just under, uh, sorry, from 20,000 in 2002 to uh, 62,000 in 2016. So that's a really strong increase. Um, the Muslim population is hugely diverse. So um, I suppose that's the, the risk of a chapter like this, that those diversities can, can get lost. Um, but uh, at risk, uh, you know, um, bearing that in mind, we, there are some learnings that can be drawn from this analysis. We did find that the population is young. The average age is 26 compared to an average age of 37 in the entire population. And that in terms of the country of origin uh, between 2006 and 2016, there was a shift from sub-Saharan Africa to South Asia in terms of the overall uh, Muslim population captured in the two censuses. Um, the, the, the Muslim population is um, heavily urban based and you can see here in relation to Dublin, um, 45%, uh, sorry, 43% of the Muslim population in Ireland lives in Dublin compared to 25% of the overall population. Um, you can see other, uh, other cities um, that the Muslim population is also uh, overrepresented in other cities. In terms of demographics, this chart illustrates the fact that uh, the population, the Muslim population, is disproportionately young and also disproportionately male, particularly in the 35 to 44 age cohorts. Um, on average, uh, the Muslim group is more highly educated than non-Muslims. A high proportion are students compared to the entire population. Um, however, we do see lower employment and higher unemployment rates, and this is particularly the case for, for Muslim women. Um, again, the likelihood to live in urban areas and in private rented accommodation. To conclude then, some policy and data issues. Um, the persistent, and that's coming out across a number of monitors, um, poor labour market outcomes from uh, among the African uh, group is a concern. Uh, the findings also underline the importance to monitor outcomes at primary and secondary level um, and the importance of monitoring the effectiveness of English language training. Um, also uh, in terms of relative outcomes in state exams. The high consistent poverty among non-EU nationals is also a concern um, and uh, demands more analysis to find which, which groups are at most, most risk and why. Um, political participation among Americans, as I said, is, is extremely low, and uh, although there's several actions addressing this in the migrant integration strategy, in the context of the elections, the local elections in May, um, you know, and, uh, civil society is asking how can we, how can we increase that. And policymakers, of course, are, are asking how can we increase those uh, that participation. Um, the engagement of departments and NGOs is really important in the delivery of the migrant integration strategy. Um, this is fundamental in the context of the mainstream <coughs> system of integration support that we have. And monitoring is really important to make sure that this is happening. In terms of data, uh, it's really uh, crucial that we have access to um, the, the, you know, the, um, the breadth and the depth of data needed to do more analysis and to find out uh, what's going on behind some of these high level indicators. An issue of particular concern is that the large group, the very large group of naturalised Irish citizens are disappearing from <coughs> data sources such as the Labour Force Survey in that they are no longer identified as, as non-Irish nationals. So, um, the question then is asked, uh, how do we continue to, to monitor and track uh, those integration outcomes? That's just a very brief plug for the European Migration Network and I'd um, encourage you to visit our website and to, to use our studies. It's a, it's a really useful resource for EU-wide information, um, objective, comparable information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. And last but not least, we have Jane Xavier uh, from the Migrant Rights Centre. Jane is uh, Brazilian. She's been living in Ireland uh, for 12 years now.
As with many migrant women from the global south, Jane has worked in various areas in the low-paid sectors, particularly childcare and hospitality. Jane has been involved in social justice activism in many different spheres, such as domestic workers' rights, uh, anti-racism and reproductive rights. She's the chairperson uh, of Au Pair Rights Ireland, and she's also a member of Migrant and Ethnic Minorities for Reproductive Justice. She holds a bachelor's degree in social science, and she works as a community support worker at the Migrant Rights Centre Ireland. So, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here, and thank you for being here. I'd say my part to be the very contemporary area, and basically uh, the experience of migrants in Ireland. Uh, that although everybody thinks that it's very clear, there are some details that if you don't go through, they become kind of blurry in Irish society. So, uh, when I was asked for a topic for my talk, I thought about the gatekeeping reflex. Because I think there's so much going on at the moment. Uh, all the political changes, uh, Brexit, Trump, uh, changes in Poland, changes in Brazil, and so on. All the advancements of the far right, and all people like very nationalist thinking that they are losing space and in that way migrants are being the affected ones. So I noticed that things were getting rough basically just after Brexit when someone called me N-word on the street and it had never happened before and just after Trump uh, I was nearly spat on the face on the street so I was like wow things are really changing. And then, just to make a parallel, it doesn't mean that I'm just like complaining about Ireland because it's also happening in my country back home as well. Now the politics, we've just we elected a guy that's basically a replica of Trump. So it's just something basically happening globally. And I might mention structural racism, but it doesn't mean that I'm just slashing Irish society because back home we also have problems. Uh, I've just like two or three weeks ago, I was just like speechless when I found out that there were lots of residents on the border who were completely against of Venezuelans coming into the country because of the whole crisis in Venezuela. And for me, it was really hard to come to terms that, yeah, we do have xenophobic people over there as well when there are so many residents living abroad. So it's something that is really happening globally. And I think. It doesn't matter where you're coming from, if you never left your country, but it's something that we really have to be aware of because it might get worse. I know I might be a little bit pessimistic, but it's the way things are going. So, uh, when I was thinking about the talk for tonight, uh, and there was something in our description about social cohesion, I thought about the Brazilian community in Gorge. That was the first time that Brazilians came over to Ireland, and it was actually really good described by Brian Fanning's book that I happen to have at home, and it was great to read it about it. And the way that they got to Gorge to work in the meat factories, and the city completely changed, it became quite vibrant, and there were jobs going on, and there were kids learning how to play Gaelic and rugby and all that and there was really an adjustment in society or even all the parties that they had. I remember arriving here in 2006 and people saying, oh you're Brazilian, I've never met Brazilians, but do you know that there's a place in the countryside that there are lots of Brazilians, you can go there and go for carnival. I know it's a very good one, I wish I could go. So it's just like, for me it was an example of how it can really, people, migrants can really adjust to the society and can bring good things. But unfortunately, what I notice is once the recession kicked in, things also got rough, especially for them. So many of them went home and went back home, and then nowadays most of them are basically undocumented, and we know all the changes with the visas, even student visas. And although there's a new scheme at the moment that MRCI has been and basically lobbying the government for years, most of them won't be able to rely on that because they didn't come over to the country as students. So, uh, when I talked about the talk for tonight, basically I talked about the immigration system and the sentiment towards migrants. 
because sometimes I do think there's a connection because there are so many barriers when we think about the, the immigration system and the way that the way to apply for visas and the way that basically when you get here you have to forget who you were in the past because your skills will be no longer recognized unless you kind of high levels in IT or eligible categories. So for example, I used to be a nutritionist for Sao Paulo Hospital and I'm from Sao Paulo, it's the biggest hospital in the country. But once I came to Ireland, my diploma was no longer recognized and I had to start working as an au pair. There's nothing wrong with being an au pair, but it is a change of mindset. When you know you have a career, when you know where you could be at that stage, and basically you have to leave everything behind and say, okay, it might be only for six months. But then I was here and I said, well, although I'm in this job and I wish I had my job back home, but still I want to travel around and so on. So things kept going and I did study childcare and worked in other areas. All those low paid sectors were always thinking, maybe one day I can get better. So when I noticed that I was looking for jobs and back in 2012, uh, there were families advertising vacancies for 50% less than what I used to get paid in 2006 and working twice as much. I said, well, things are going really bad. And then I decided to become an activist and basically support our pairs since then. And just last year, that I was able to secure a, a paid job because all these years I've been working as a volunteer, basically because I saw everything that my community was going through and with changes with the visa that in the past used to be one year, now only eight months. And I said, well, people are not settling, I'm settled here, so I should do something about it. And still talking about the structural racism and immigration system, uh, what really uh, struck me a few days ago was to, to realize that nowadays if a migrant is in Ireland, even paying for their courses, whatever, uh, the person has been uh, encountering some problems to renew their visas, although they want to, to have their papers in the country, because they might have to pay 25 euros only for booking an appointment in the GNIB. So it's something that you kind of, uh, in the past it was pretty bad because you had to wake up four in the morning and be there in the cold, in the rain, queuing, that was pretty bad. And when you change all oh, technology, that's great. Finally, things will get better. There's no longer queues. And then you see now that you have to pay and it might take more than three or four months for you to try to find. Like, my sister is over only for a short while and she decided to enroll in an English course. And it took us three months to find a slot for her. And at some stage I was like, that's unbelievable that some people are pushed to buy, to having to pay 25 euros just for a slot to go to the immigration and having paid an English course and having to pay 300 euros. So it's just all these messages that you see around that only when you push them together you see that, uh, wait a minute, why things are, are going so badly? And why it has to be so complicated for migrants? And migrants have their skills. There are lots of people coming to the country that they can contribute, but they're not allowed to use their skills here. Basically, most of them work on low-paid sectors. So what is going on? There's always a kind of gatekeeping at some stage that stops people from flourishing and from bringing more to the Irish society. And then I was also thinking about the whole thing about the global south and the global north, and all the difference between being an expat and being a migrant. That is, you were talking about that some people are able to live in some countries and they are able to speak their languages, and for the Irish, they move to other countries where they still speak English, they don't have the language for years, but when you have to go through that, and you still have to learn the language, it's always that sentiment that people take you for granted. When you say, oh, you know, I used to have a career back home, and people kind of look at you, uh, really? But you're from the global south. And uh, tied into that, uh, the labor market discrimination, 
And it happened to me in two occasions that I basically applied for jobs and I was never, uh, never called for an interview. So once I got married, I said, okay, I'd rather keep my own surname, but only, only to check us. So I sent two CVs. I applied as Jane Xavier and Jane Kelly. So Jane Kelly is very <laughs> Irish, right? And then, yeah, I was called for the interview as Jane Kelly. And then once, once I got there, I remember the person opening the door, uh, have you seen Jane Kelly? And I was like, oh, Jane Kelly. <laughs> it wasn't great. I wish I was using my own surname, but at that stage was the only way to get the job. So I did get the job. I left afterwards, but yeah, it's just to see that the discrimination is still there and migrants do feel more. So when I was hearing your numbers about work and so on and about the skills, yeah, most of my friends are highly skilled, but they can't really use their skills here and they will be working low paid jobs. And there's always the, the stereotype especially when it comes to the global care chains. The Filipinos are always carers, the Brazilians are always all pairs, and all pairs are not really workers, they are just students. But then, yeah, there's legislation out there where people still, they, they don't want to be aware because they close themselves the way that it always been. And if there are migrants who can do those jobs and they pay less, it will be the way it is because it's a comfort zone. So that's what I'm talking about, the gatekeeping, the way that maybe you go into a recruitment process and even if it's a blind CV thing, people might have the networks and people might be recommended to that job. So it's all about also your networks, your social capital, things that migrants hardly never have. So you'll be always harder to achieve, even though you might have the same skills, or even though at some stage you go to the same universities here, but you will always be one step behind compared to people who were born here. And then uh, I was also thinking about the lack of representation, just like Emma mentioned, because there's very little in academia, in TV, in journalism, in high-level positions. It's very rare to see a migrant who is a CEO. And I wonder when this is happening, will people really be comfortable about it? Is Irish society prepared to that? Or people will think, ah, migrants are not qualified enough. Oh no, this person, this person won't be good enough because, you know, the person wasn't born here, the person doesn't really know how to navigate the system even though the person might have been living here for the whole life, might have been studied here, or <coughs> even born here, but we always be the migrant and not the expat. And then the whole thing about uh, voices unheard, it's great to have this space here tonight, thank you, and it would be great to have even more, because it's basically we need to have more migrants speaking for themselves, not always like people speaking for them. It's great to have everyone coming to this area and trying to shed light, but we need more voices as well, and different people, not always the same ones. Mm -hmm. And just like be prepared, if you have a new uh, recession, a new economic crisis, mm -hmm. are we prepared for that? Or will we say that we no longer need migrants because we need those jobs back? As in the past, migrants were good like in the care sector, but when the recession started, oh, you know, we don't really need you. And then all those Filipinos who came over to the country, all regularized, and then the government said, oh, you know what, we can no longer issue uh, work permits to you because we're in the middle of recession. And then basically they came over, they built up their lives here, and they left to dry. So it's just something to think about, the way that they the road is changing and are we really prepared for that? So it's just think about this gatekeeping reflex because at the end of the day we all have, even if you're back in our countries and there's other people coming, you always kind of, in some ways you have to mind yourselves and to remind yourselves that, uh, wait a minute, we're, we're talking about equality no matter where the person's coming from. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jane. Uh, now we open the floor for questions. So we have maybe a couple of rounds of questions. We take three in one go.
Uh, there's a roaming mic, I think, as well. Uh, if you could state your name and your affiliation as well, that'd be fantastic. And then keep the questions as short as possible. Maybe you want to direct them to the entire panel or to individuals. Please say that as well. We'll keep them very brief. Anybody? Comments, questions? Yes, please. And we take three brief ones. No, three for me now. No, no, three. three, three. Uh, I'm just curious about the... Um, um, I used to work in one of those visa colleges uh, about ten years ago. Um, and I'm just curious about these time, this boom and bust cycles that we have in in the economy. Uh, no one can predict when the next one is, but I've heard around 2020 will be the next one. But in terms of migrants coming, I mean, there seems to be, a, like you talked about the Filipinos, uh, the care workers, I mean, is there a period of time when people will look at this and go, we have five years to come in and make money and get out? You know, are, there, are, are there people who will look at it that way? Like, like when Irish guys used to go to London and work on building sites, you knew there was a time period, and then when it started to go down, people came back or went somewhere else. And, and moved on to other places. Is it the same for au pairs or the same for people who work in the low, the, the low paid sector? Uh, okay, maybe we take two more. Do we have others uh, over here, Steve? And then at the back also. Thanks. I remember the st statistics uh, uh, some time ago that uh, the and the number of people. Uh, uh, speaking particular languages, uh, uh, English was first, uh, Mandarin was second, Polish was third, and Irish was third, fourth uh, language. Uh, and uh, but you didn't mention any Chinese, so I wonder if you could comment on that. Okay, and the gentleman at the back with the. Thank you. I wanted your opinion on what is necessary to get more to get political representation in this country. As a political a political master is a very ethic, eth, ethically Irish, as you will and everybody sees, and there's a great dearth of representation. But without representation, it is much less likely you'll get your needs met. Thank you, and over to you, panelists. Okay, I'll take the first one. Uh, to the guy there who's talking about the, the period of time that migrants come to the country. Well, I don't think there is a period defined per se. I do think, let's say, for example, in Philippines, they did have a scheme with Irish government. So there was a kind of, there were war, uh, working permits were issued from people coming over and then they were sending remittances home. So of course they stayed here for as long as the economy was prosperous, but once in 2009 the, go the government decided that they were no longer issuing visas, of course these people would go home or stay here because they built up their lives here mm. and stay undocumented. I'd say it's just probably the way that the Irish did in London or if you're going only just for a while, once you know so that the economy you're back in your country back home it's getting it's getting better, you might go back to test the water and see if it's worth it staying there. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's just the way that I think. Um, I could answer or try to respond to the politics question. Um, with the Africa Centre initially and then with Forum Polonia and other groups, I ran a whole bunch of studies of immigrant political participation. And the job was always to basically do the research on the political parties themselves and ask them what were they doing to encourage migrants to become candidates, become voters, become party members and so on. The first study was run in 2004 when uh, Rotimi Adabari and Theo Bacius and Ennis, two former asylum seekers, were elected as town councillors. Inspired by that in 2009, something like 40 immigrant candidates stood for election. And at that particular time, even though the recession was looming, Irish political parties in the main were very enthusiastic about the potential migrant vote. Politicians are very vote-hungry beings, and in our transfer system, if they think you'll vote, they, 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 they'll be very interested in you. But after the 2009 election, political parties became very disheartened at the actual very low amount of migrant participation in politics. In local government elections, migrants can vote without having to be Irish citizens. 
And although there's now a campaign underway again, there was one underway at the previous local election, the 2009 local election, and so on. Uh, migrant voter participation levels are very, very low, and the political parties are aware of this. So whilst in theory they're very interested in responding to migrant votes, if migrants themselves are unwilling or unable to basically register for votes, that certainly basically is a, creates a huge problem. Uh, the hope for the future is that those migrants who have become Irish citizens, the 140,000 who have become Irish citizens since, uh, well, 2002 or three, that those people have votes in the national elections as well, and that they're using their votes. But political parties are, are masters at, at understanding street by street who votes and who does not vote. And I remember some conversations with politicians who basically had done some work in trying to get migrants to vote, but were now absolutely concerned, you know, they, as far as they were concerned, it was a waste of their time going after the migrant vote if people weren't going to turn out to vote. So if migrants are unwilling or unable to vote, then that, said that, that basically is part of the problem. So I would turn around and say that it's the, the challenge is to mobilize people within communities. Uh, you know, the, obviously voter registration campaigns could be better. Obviously there could be more resources available. But I do think that if migrants themselves were more willing to participate in the electoral process, uh, you know, I do think then parties would take more note of this. I think what's happened in the last couple of years is that migrants are less likely to be front of house candidates, but in all the political parties, there are migrant, there are migrant members now at this stage, and some are very, very active. And that some communities, you know, you, you, you would see people who are Polish and Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Labour, and so on and so forth. So there are people, you know, in the political parties, but I don't think the political parties believe that the migrant vote is there quite as yet. And I think really there needs, that needs to be woken up and galvanised in some way. Because I think if we want our policy to resemble its diversity, pardon me, people have to vote in the first instance as well as just being interested in politics. Well, maybe your colleague beside you would throw some light on why migrants, although they want change, are not coming out to vote. Okay. Yeah. Just very, brief, very, very briefly. Very briefly. Let's just. Can I answer that one? Yeah. No, let's just let's just let the panelists uh, answer. <laughs> Otherwise, we run out of time. <laughs> Well, what I see from the Brazilian perspective is we have so, prob so many problems back home with corruption and so on that when we come over here we have a mindset that we're not really going to make a difference. And then when we see all these factors, all this structural racism and some of us don't really feel that we really belong, so they would say, eh, will I really vote? Is it my vote really counting? So it's kind of, let's say, all the oppressions, all the intersections, so we just put them down and even I've been trying to mobilize a few Brazilians to go to one of these groups, it's probably one of them that Brian was mentioning, and the Brazilians just said, oh no, not at the moment, I'm just frustrated <coughs> with the whole thing back home. <coughs> just uh, briefly, another um, explanation that, should I turn it off? Um, that came up at the launch yesterday of the integration monitor was the link between uh, the prevalence of migrants in the private rented accommodation sector and voting. And uh, it was a point that was made by Marie Gil Martin, um, uh, who, who was discussing the report for us, that it's really difficult and it's onerous to keep registering um, to vote uh, when you might have several moves. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And just to follow on um, from Brian's point, about the increased um, naturalisation. It's really interesting that we're seeing EEA nationals naturalising because, of course, EU nationals have a similar bundle of rights and entitlements to, to Irish nationals. And one of the few added advantages of naturalising is political participation. So there, there's, you know, there's, I suppose, a, a possibility that that could follow through into increased participation and, and one would hope so. Okay, thank you. Do we have a couple of more questions, please? Yes, they are in the middle. Um, do you have a, um, a distinction on... Uh, um, sorry, ooh, that's loud. <laughs> um, do you uh, create a distinction um, between migrants and immigrants? Um, do you use those two... I want to say labels or identification has like interchangeably or is there a difference for you? Okay, and who else? Yes, <coughs> gentlemen over there. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is just for Emma. Could I ask you if it's possible to pick behind 
the label African, so in terms of white African and black minor other minority ethnic African in terms of employment race, because I, I would posit that there are quite stark differences there as well, uh, if you have access to those data, I'm not sure. Yeah, and last question at the very back. Um, maybe Jane would know this. Um, I know that in terms of hate crimes in Ireland, there's movement um, coming from universities and, and activists to legislate, to have legislation about that. Do you know um, if there's any movement towards um, transparency in hiring processes or anything to improve the injustice that's happening in that sense? And if I could ask for brief responses to these small panelists. Um, I'll go first. Uh, in relation to the difference uh, between migrant and, and immigrant, in the report, um, uh, we, we probably speak much more accurately and reflect uh, the terminology used within the data. I may be using migrant and immigrant uh, interchangeably as I speak, but the data will refer to um, country of birth or nationality. Uh, and in the name, I don't know if that answers your question sufficiently. Okay. Um, I neglected to answer the question about Chinese uh, nationals. We don't break them out. Um, the, 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 uh, the sample sizes aren't sufficient to analyse to, to break out uh, Chinese nationals. I had a quick check of naturalisation rates, and um, the Chinese group is still uh, well represented among um, people naturalising in the past uh, number of years. Um, in relation to the employment rates, no, we can't go any further than um, what I presented. We actually have to pull um, two sets of data to, to be able to draw the response we have. Um, I'd say, you know, you're, you're right, there will be, um, there will be differences in, in the experience there. Um, I think uh, following on from, from Jane's um, perspective, uh, it's possibly interesting to note some research that we conducted in the SRI in 2009, whereby we sent out um, uh, CVs for job um, vacancies um, with Irish nationality but with different um, signing names. And we found indeed that the, the non-Irish names were, uh, sorry, the Irish names were twice as likely to be called to interview as, as the non-Irish names. Interestingly, um, we had three names. We had an uh, African name, a uh, German name and an Asian name, and there was no statistically significant difference between those three groups. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Uh, about the hate crime, uh, there is a group called uh, European Network Against Racism in Ireland that they've been trying to push the legislation for hate crime for a few years. I was involved with them probably 2015, but it's an ongoing process and the government hasn't passed anything. So, yeah, they would be the ones to go when it comes to hate crime legislation in Ireland. Is there activism Thank in a you. similar way towards um, the job hiring processes? Uh, well, they would try to go for all forms of racism, but at the moment they are trying to focus on hate crime legislation because of all the violence against. Uh, immigrants and especially now with all the global changes, but it's also on their agenda. Brian, did you want to come in? Yeah, 10 years ago, 2008, the government shut down the National Consultative Committee on Racism and Interculturalism, which was the body through which the national anti racism strategy was run. For the last 10 years, the Irish government has played no role or part in leading on racism or anti racism in Ireland. And in that vacuum, various NGO groups like ENAR. Uh, and uh, others have come forward and tried to do their own best to collect statistics. But my own feeling is, is that an awful lot of the data that's coming out of published by NGOs on racism is indicative of a problem, but it's not comprehensive. It really is the job of the government and the state to ensure that the laws of the land, including the Equal Status Act and the Employment Equality Act, are followed. Uh, if there is racism in societies and this is not addressed, it is a social problem and damaging to social cohesion. I don't. I really don't understand at this stage why the government would not have as part of its integration strategy uh, an anti a national anti-racism program uh, based on sound data sources, evidence-based, and so on and so forth. So this is a real gap or vacuum. Uh, so I think what we have from the NGOs in particular are quite a lot of case studies of racism, 
uh, but we have basically, we don't have the authoritative data sets or joined up data sets that we probably need on some areas, but more importantly than that, we just don't have the, the centralized political commitment to addressing racism. And in that kind of context, whether we have a hate crime law or not, is perhaps by the by, because I think we do need joined up thinking, not just law, but basically government taking responsibility, resources being put into it, people being trained in organizations, uh, organizations like the, like the guards having their feet held to the fire to ensure that they are basically policing all the communities equally and safely in the same way, and so on and so on and so on. That hiring practices in public bodies are, are, are fair and accountable, uh, that other organizations are held properly to account. So I'm at the stage where I do think we do need a comprehensive anti-racism strategy, but my own sense of this, having studied it as well as quite just something about it now and again, is that there were, historically there was quite a lot of antipathy between the state actors and the NGO actors, uh, and with the state actors being in particular taking a sort of a siege mentality approach where they're being criticized by NGO actors. <coughs> so I, th I think there is really a need for some joined up thinking here, and I think there's really a need for government to take on more responsibility here, because it's for the well-being of society in general. Thank you very much. So can I first of all thank the three panelists very much.